that as like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so. So that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so. In other words, just like Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Hallelujah. And so we have here a, a statement by Paul to the church at Rome that, that we, just like we were buried with Christ in baptism, and just like the glory of the God raised, uh, raised Jesus from the dead, we should walk in newness of life. Uh, the word life here, it comes from the Greek zoe, and that is God's life, supernatural life, life in the manner that God has it. Um, and so we understand this. The Amplified says, We were buried therefore with him by the baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, so we too might habitually live and behave in newness of life. Thank God for it. You know, we're, we're, to, we're to live a life from a different source of a different place. The life that we now live does not come from um, our, our flesh. That is bios. Uh, the, the manner of life or natural life is bios in the Greek. Uh, the life that we're to live from is zoe. Uh, anybody can live from the bios. Anybody can live from their flesh. Um, <coughs> it is not the abundant life it's not supernatural life we're to live from a life that springs from the inner man and that life is the zoe life of god um, jesus said in eight, luke 8 14 uh, talking about the, the parable of the sower he gets down to this statement in verse 14 it says and that which fell among the thorns are they which have heard it go forth and are choked with the cares and riches and pleasures of this life that words bios natural life manner of life so natural life or manner of life chokes um, the word, and it brings, it brings no fruit to perfection. That's what Jesus said in, in Luke 8, 14. And so we understand that when we, tr if we attempt to allow the bios life to dominate, <coughs> excuse me, or control us, it'll choke out the word. It's, it's, it's natural. Uh, I, I, I guess that's spelled wrong. It's... Um, it is normal, there you go, for the bios of the life, of bios life, to choke out the supernatural life or the word of God because it, it dictates its manners, its, its uh, force operates in the flesh from, you know, the manner of life, the natural life. It is not supernatural life, and therefore it operates in a different vein. And, and Jesus said that the cares and riches and pleasures of this natural life will enter in and choke the word and bring forth no fruit unto perfection. So... Uh, there's the, the two lives that we have here, Zoe and Bios. As a boy, and, and, and when you're living in the earth, uh, B.C., before Christ, before you were born again, um, you lived your life after that manner of life, that natural man, that natural manner of life. The dictates of the flesh, the circumstances of life, things around you, all governed and controlled your life in a way um, that was not supernatural. There's, you know, there's nothing supernatural about your previous life. Everything you did uh, as an unborn again, <laughs> that's just a really, really bad way of saying that, as an unregenerated person was dictated to and governed and controlled by your natural life, the, the flesh. You, you were, you were um, subject to the passions of the flesh. You were controlled and dominated by the desires of the flesh. And uh, you were not living from the life within, because there was no life within you to live from. You didn't have the life of God in you to cause you to be able to live that way. But Paul said that when we were, we were buried with him, therefore, by baptism into his death, so uh, we died unto sin. We died unto that natural life. You know, Paul makes an interesting statement in uh, one place. He says, he says, put off the old man and put on the new man, which after Christ, which is created in all righteousness and godliness in Christ Jesus. Um, because we've been born again. The fact, you know, the fact that we're born again, the fact that the nature and the life of God's in us <coughs> gives us an opportunity to put off old things, put on new things. Hallelujah. And uh, let's see here. Let's say put off. Hallelujah. I'm going to do my own. Uh, I'm not really going to do my own if I can't spell. Let's see here. Da -da 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 -da. Ephesians 4, 22, that you um, put off concerning the former conversation. The word conversation is lifestyle. The old man, which is corrupt according to 
after the deceitful lust and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Wherefore, putting away lying, speak every man the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more. Rather let him labor working with his hands that thing which is good that he may give to him that needeth. Let no corrupt communication. And he goes on and on and on. Uh, all ma bitterness. Verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another. Tended hearted, forgiving one another. Even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. Notice this really begins here. Um, talking about that you put off concerning the former lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And he gets to verse 24 and says, put on the new man. Well, how can you do this? Well, you have to learn to live from a different place. You cannot, you can, you can no longer live from the former man, the old man, which is governed by what? The deceitful lust. Isn't that right? Back at the, what was it, was it verse, um, just put off the old man, verse 22, or something like that. So here he says, we're buried with him by baptism. Okay? Put off the concern of the former conversation, the old former lifestyle of the old man. Paul writes in Romans 6, 4, says, we're buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And we understand that God's life, that supernatural life is in us, but Paul writes here in Ephesians 4, put off the old man. It is the difference between victory and defeat, between living in the supernatural and just living a carnal Christian life, is whether you've put all, you're putting off the old man and you're putting on the new or not. Where are you living from? What life source are you living from? And um, if you don't have, if you're not living from the supernatural life force, if you're not putting off the old man, and you're putting on the new man, you're going to live like the old man. If you, if you leave the old man out there, he'll rise up and you'll act like him. Ugly. All right? Coyote ugly, I guess. Hallelujah. Now, that, that old man, that, that, that put off concerning the former conversation, the former lifestyle of the old man, he wants to rise up and dominate you. Now, Paul says something really interesting uh, in one place. He said, I buffet my body, I keep it under. He referred to his body almost like it was it was a possession and not him. See, that's how he talked about his body. I buffet my body daily. Hallelujah. I keep it under. So there are dictates and there are passions of the flesh, of the carnal nature, that um, that want to rise up and dominate us. But as born again believers, born of the life of God. We are, we are told to live our life from a different place. We're to live it from the life that abides within, from not the bios, the natural life, but the zoe, the supernatural life of God. Man was intended in original creation to be a spirit-dominated being. Be a, he is, man is a spirit, has a soul, lives in a body. At the fall of man, man's flesh took ascendancy over his spirit because Satan, Satan would drive the flesh. And so man became a creature to the dictates and desires and wants of the flesh. And, um, and so that's why it was so important for man to be born again so the life of God could enter into a spirit and a dominating spirit could once again control the body. Okay? And keep it under. You know, when God's life wants to keep the flesh controlled. All things done in moderation. God, you know, buffet your body, keep your body under. Romans, uh, Paul writes to the church in the, in the 12th chapter and says, um, sometimes you can't get your right word. I beseech you, therefore, can't get the right word to get it going. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Just say present your bodies. A living sacrifice. <coughs> now, he didn't expect us to go cut ourselves and put ourselves down and burn ourselves up and sacrifice ourselves to God or hang ourselves on a cross like they do in the Philippines every year. You know, they have that, that whole Catholic thing they do down there. Um, he wants us to present our bodies, what? A living sacrifice. Now, King James says this, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. 
where reasonable really comes from a word in the Greek that should be translated or better translated, uh, spiritual. So I beseech you, I beg you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies. Why? You've got to keep your body under control. You've got to keep it basically in a, in a status of a living sacrifice, constantly canceling its desires, constantly saying, no, you can't do that, constantly saying, why? Because it will rise up and do, do some stuff that will get you in trouble. Amen. It will. If you turn your body loose, it'll do stuff. Because there's, there's, because the body, now understand this, your body's not redeemed. Ephesians, the first chapter says, they were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise unto the day of that purchase, or unto that purchased possession. There will be a day, remember this, it says when the Lord returns, this corruptible shall put on incorruptible, this mortal shall put, put on immortality, and we change in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. The body is not redeemed. Now, you can get your body healed, you can keep your body under, but it is still not, it is death doomed. And see, the, the glorified body is not death doomed. The, the body is corruptible. The body has dictates and desires. And that's why, you know, sometimes you take scriptures, and this is how we get into error in the church. You'll get people coming along teaching a message about the grace of God, and, and they'll, over, they'll, they'll take the scriptures that apply to the spirit of man, and how, how God has redeemed the spirit of man and take those same scriptures and overemphasize them into the realm of the flesh and take all constraint off the flesh because it's under grace and they've misapplied those scriptures in a way that, that causes problems. Because when you tell somebody that you don't have to repent, you don't have to do this, you know, God's already forgiven. Well, God has forgiven you, but I tell you what, if you do something with your flesh, you've got you to get that thing cleaned up. And uh, I had one, one couple told a pastor, that, they, that wasn't married, they were just living together. He told them, he said, well, your problem is probably that you're living together and not li and living in sin and not, and not you know, uh, living in fornication. And they said, oh, no, Pastor, we're under grace. That don't matter. <laughs> well, it does matter. We just read there from um, um, over in Ephesians where it talked about all the things he told you to stop doing. You know, there's a lot of things that the New Testament tells us to stop doing because we're new creatures. You know, if you're born again, you shouldn't be doing this. Well, this is, this is, um, this is a grace message. How about this? this is an Ed Taylor version of a grace message. Learn to live from the right place. Amen? Learn to live from the right place. And the right place is living from your re born again, recreated human spirit. Now, you're born again, recreated human spirit, but you're feeding the good word of God. Because Paul right here says in, verse, in, in, in Romans chapter 12, Again, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, if it's a living sacrifice, that means there's a perpetual sacrificial attitude towards your body all the time. That, that's what it, that's, that's, if it's a living sacrifice, there is a perpetual attitude, uh, just an attitude of a perpetual sacrifice of your body all the time. I'm not even getting the bobblehead tonight. It's the, it's, it's, it's the truth. And he says that, it, that that is a holy and acceptable unto God, and it is your spiritual service. It is spiritual service. Uh, and, of course, verse, and, and the one, two, three, four, fifth word of this verse is brethren. Talking to the, te talking to the church. <coughs> He's saying brethren. It is a spiritual service to keep your body under. Because your body, if you just turn it loose, it'll go do stuff. And this, and he says, and be not conformed to the world. Now listen, he's telling the church not to be conformed to the world, which means you can. If you couldn't be, he wouldn't say don't be. If it was impossible for you as a born-again believer to, to be conformed to the world, he wouldn't write and tell you not to be conformed to the world. Hallelujah. Well, you know, the word conform comes from the Greek, a Greek word meaning to be fashioned, shaped, molded. So it's like pouring your life into the image of the, to, to, a, to a worldly attitude and a worldly action and a worldly uh, doing. You know, you got Christians who go around thinking that it's okay to be homosexual. Oh, there's nothing wrong. You know, you, they, they got to have love. Not in sin. It's all right to fornicate. It's all right to do whatever they want to do. 
you know, uh, da, 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 go on and on and on and on and on. Well, the Word of God says don't be conformed to the world. Don't accept worldly mindsets, worldly attitudes, worldly positions. Hallelujah. So don't be fashioned according that way. And see, some, some people teach stuff. When, they, when stuff gets out of balance, it's always going to bring the flesh to the forefront. Always does. Maybe they wasn't intended to do that. Maybe the people preaching it didn't intend to do that. But when it gets out of balance, <coughs> and I'll be honest with you, about 20 years ago, some of these exact, exact, exact same results we're getting from some of the, the excessive grace teachings that have been going on. Now, grace is a wonderful subject, but there's some excessive stuff. It's some of the exact same results we were getting when people are, are teaching righteousness in an excessive manner. They were teaching you were righteous no matter what. You couldn't lose your righteousness. You know, you could go out and do what didn't matter. Well, you know, did did y'all know that Martin Luther, when he, he, he you know, because he, he, he nailed his, his thesis to the, the door of the church, I think it was a thousand, thousand, his, his whatever. Was, I, I forgot the name of it. I, I want to say thousand thesis, whatever it is. But when he nailed his thesis to the church about justified by grace, I mean by faith, you know, the man is justified by faith, not by works, ca called a heretic in his writings. You see, this is how you get, if you get, get a partial revelation <coughs> and, not, and not fully substantiate with the Word of God, or you're trying to move so far away from something that was in excess on the other side. He said, I believe a man can commit 10,000 fornications and not lose his salvation. Well, you know, it's got a really interesting word, uh, statement in the Bible that says that he that, you know, he that, pract he that commits sin, well, see, uh, you, get, you get off on the deep end with that, he, you know, if somebody committed sin, they're going to go to hell. That, that Greek word, the Greek tense and the structure of that place where it says, uh, he that committed sin, doesn't have the life of God in him, something along those lines. It says, he that practices. The Greek says, he that practices. If you're committing 10,000 fornications, you're practicing. Hello, are you here? That is practice. I mean, you just, good gracious. I mean, once a day, would be, take you three years to get to a thousand. So you're thinking ten, you know, ten thousand will be thirty years of. Oh, I'm not. Pra I'm, I'm not living in sin. You're practicing fornication if you commit ten thousand. So he got excessive there. And his revelation that we're justified by faith was right, but you can take that to an extreme. And we did that in righteousness teaching. We took it to a stream that it just didn't matter. Kind of got that almost. We almost got gnostic in our teachings where it just didn't matter what you did with your flesh because we were spirit beings. And that's really some of the stuff that's going on right now where it doesn't matter what you do, whether you do or don't with your flesh because you're saved. It's a spiritual thing. And that's, that's error and it's wrong and it's dangerous. Be not conformed to the world, but be transformed. Greek word, and we know this, we've taught this before, metamorpho. English word, metamorphosis. We all know what happens in a metamorphosis. Caterpillars become butterflies, tadpoles become bullfrogs. And Barry McGuire is now singing, bullfrogs and butterflies have both been born again, which is not accurate. We don't, we don't have a metamorphosis in the new birth. You are, you are born again. But Paul says, don't be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, what does renewing your mind teach you? It teaches you where to live from. The Word of God teaches you to let the spirit man dominate. The Word of God teaches you to live from that. Living from the inner man does not mean letting your flesh do what it wants to do. We just read here in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, you're to live in a mindset of perpetual sacrifice towards your body. Paul said, I buffet my body. I don't know. Um, and I tell you, you know, I know some folks think that meant uh, buffet over at Shoney's All You Can Eat, but that's not what it meant, you know, praise the Lord. It means to buffet, to keep it under. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 26 says, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly so far, I not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest by, listen, lest by any means when I have preached to others, I should be a castaway. Well, that's a pretty strong statement. That if he doesn't keep his body under, even when he's preached to others, in the end he could become a castaway because he didn't keep his body under control. Isn't that what he said? <laughs> that's what I just read. Okay. Uh, so, understand 
we cannot live from our flesh. We have to live. We have to live from our spirit, man. We have to live and keep the flesh under and, and control it and dominate it with the word of God and let the word of God um, rise up within us, living out of that inner man. So now back over to where we were earlier in Romans 12 where he says, be not conformed to the world. Don't be fashioned. Be transformed, metamorphosed by the renewing of your mind. That you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So here we have Paul saying that you can be conformed to the world. And that we have a responsibility not to be. Remember? He's talking, now this comes on the heels of keeping your body under or offering it as a living sacrifice. Wow. I said, wow. Somebody say that backwards. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Bill. Brother Bill got it. Hallelujah. We are to live from that Zoe life of God that you know Paul writes in the Amplified in Romans 6, 4, so that we might habitually, I like that, live and behave in newness of life or in this Zoe. Habitually. That is, we're, we're, to live in the, we're to develop the habit of living in the Zoe of God. Now, before you were born again, you developed the habit of living according to the manner of life, the natural life. And even after some people get born again, they're so governed by their flesh, they continue to live in that. Romans 12 tells us how not to continue doing that, how not to be fashioned, have, have a renewing of the mind. In other words, it takes the instruction of the Word of God to teach us how to live. And so part of the proper teaching of the Word of God is to teach us what the Scripture says about how we're to live. Hallelujah. That's good news, isn't it? Yeah. Philippians 2.16 calls. Um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. When we were born again, we were born again from the life of God. Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, destroy. He's come that I might, we might have life, Zoe, have it more abundantly, a Zoe again there. The natural life chokes the word. We talked about that. It's, it's the carnal life. In, it is carnal life that is enmity against God. Ephesians 4, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Don't walk as other Gentiles walk. In the vanity of their mind. See, the mind that's not renewed to the Word of God will be a mind, will be a, a mind that's enmity against God. It'll be a carnal mind. And it'll be vanity. Okay, in the vanity. What do you mean the vanity of their mind? It is vain to think that you can live any way you want to live and please God. It is vain to think that the scriptures are not applicable to you in every area of life. It is vain to think that God demands less of you now that you're born again than he did before, you know, than, than, he, did, than he did of uh, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. All he, and all, he told them not to eat of the fr fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and, good and evil, and they did. And it was consequences. Those are all, it's all the vanity of your mind. It's vanity to think that because you're born again, you can do whatever you want to do and it doesn't have consequences. That's vain. Philippians 2.16 calls the word of God the word of life. Holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. It means as we apply the word of God, we're applying the life of God to the situation. It overcomes the works of the enemy. His works are dead works. They rob us of faith, cause us to accept defeat instead of victory. We must live from the life within. God's life is, the, is life that sets us free. Can somebody say amen? Hallelujah. The word of, see, when we learn to live from God's life, we're learning to live from the place of victory, the place of freedom, the place of pleasing of him, to him. Amen. You'll, you know, I, I just don't understand people who, who try to find ways to say it's okay. You know, well, I'm under the grace of God. It just doesn't matter because, you know, God loves me no matter what. That was never the question whether God loves you. 
That will never be the question. People will go to hell and God will love them. But they will still go to hell because they rejected his sacrifice. It won't have a thing to do with his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now notice, God loved the world. He gave his son and whosoever believes on him won't perish but have everlasting life. He gave him because he loved the world. He loved everybody in the world. But the, there's a, there was a requirement. Even in his love of providing the answer, it still demanded that the whosoever believe. Even his love sent Jesus for the world, but only the whosoever that believe got the benefit of having everlasting life. It was available to everybody. His love. So you say, people say, well, the love of God, the love of God. The love of God sent Jesus. The love of God made provision. But spiritual justice demands whosoever believe on the sacrifice or it won't work. Now, God loves us, but there are still whosoever's basically throughout the New Testament. You got to believe. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Okay, there's lots of scriptures, you know. Um, some people believe, will go around and tell you that God's going to bless me and prosper me no matter what I do. If you go read the book of 2 Corinthians 8, 9, and 10, you can't come away with that. And that is a New Testament passage written by Paul. It wasn't written by Peter, James, or John. Now, some people go around and teach you, don't listen to Peter, James, or John because they disagree with Paul. I'm like, come on, guys. Are you kidding me? No, they have scriptures that, that you don't like, so you say don't listen to them. You can't do that with the Bible. Holding forth, forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not. Listen to what Paul said. Holding forth. Holding forth. The word of life. That I have not run. Listen, he doesn't want to run in vain. Can you say amen? Or labor in vain. Verse 15 says, you know, that he may be... Um, do all things without murmuring and despising, so that you may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. I found that interesting. Do all things without murmuring and, and what? Just reading, that ye may be blameless and harmless or sincere, the sons of God without rebuke. In other words, you're not rebuked for your actions. In the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if I be offered upon the sacrifice of service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with all your joy. Um, for this same cause we do you joy and rejoice with me. Hallelujah. If you kind of back up, you'll find out, um, he gets, he's talking about verse 12, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation, with fear and tremor, that goes over good with most people. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. People just love it <laughs> when you read that one. Hallelujah. You, know, you, you, work, you, 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 <coughs> you don't get saved, but you work it out or you walk out your salvation with fear and trembling. With charismatics, we don't, for faith people, don't like talking about being afraid. Just don't, we don't want to just please God. It, you should be an, an awe, an, uh, you should be in awe of displeasing God. It should, it should bother you that you would even displease God. Have a, have a desire not to. We should live in a reverential awe of him to the point we never want to displease him. And that we should live, and we want to live out of that life that's in us. Um, Romans 8, 2. Uh, let's, let's look at Romans 8. Good passage of scripture. People love to mess it up. Well, that's not in verse 1. It's down in verse 4. Well, hallelujah. I need to turn off my, my thing. That's my, my iPad just sent a notification through. Thank you very much. <coughs> there is, therefore, now co no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. And you got people coming along saying, now well, you know, the next part, who walk out not after flesh but after spirit, it's not in the original Greek. And that's because they're reading the, the, the minuscules. They're reading the, the transcripts used for the revised version. King James was written from the major text, the minority text and the major text. Um, there's the minority text and the majority text. King James was written from majority. 
revised came from the minority text. Um, there are less of them and less, uh, and they are less accurate and less consistent with the older translations. We've got translations older than Greek manuscripts. We don't have the first original Greek manuscripts. We have Greek manuscripts that are predated by translations. Okay? So when you find they found Greek manuscripts, they go back and tra compare them with the translations. The majority text is more accurate. Okay? The minority text, which around the 18, late 1800s became the uh, hot item of the day to use it, has a bunch of things that do not line up with the majority text. And um, the, R, the revised version came out of those. And so people use these scriptures to say, oh, see, uh, there's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, but that's it. It doesn't matter what I do, I'm not condemned. <laughs> anyway, and uh, who walk not after the flesh. Oh, let's just leave that out. because uh, For the law of the spirit of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own son in likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemned sin in the flesh, the, that the righteousness of God of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay? <coughs> they say that they took it and moved it up there. Well, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, you just kind of, uh, you go to the different texts, but I think it still says the same thing. It's in the same passage of, of Scripture. The righteousness of God, the righteousness of the law is still fulfilled us who, walk out, who don't walk, out, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. If you walk after the flesh, you're not going to fulfill the righteousness of the law. Matter of fact, the law, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. Okay. But if you live according to your flesh, you're going you're to activate the law of sin and death. You can't get around it. You can't live according to the flesh. Because Paul, and you just can't take this out of here and go, whoop, that's it. That's one little passage. You read Romans 6, Romans 7, Romans 8, all the way over to Romans 12. And it's all, you're, you're, you're governing the flesh. You're dictating the flesh. You're, you're condemning the flesh. You're keeping the flesh in control. You're not living outside the dictates of the life of God. God wants you to live from the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. But saying I'm under the law of, of grace and under the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and then go out and do anything you want to with your flesh is not living from the law of the spirit of life that's in Christ Jesus. You're living, you're living from the law of sin and death. You're living according to your flesh. Because he says in verse 4, beginning that it's in verse 1, who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Verse 5, for they that do mind the things of the flesh, I mean, th they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they to the after the spirit, the things of the spirit, to be carnally minded is death, to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither do he can be. So they that are in the flesh cannot please God, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he's none of his. And um, he goes on and talks. He said, well, in ver if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, that has raised up Christ from the dead, shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtors, we are debtors not to the flesh, but to live after the flesh. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye live th through the spirit, do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. Think about it. Now listen, he said all this, but then he comes back in verse 13. You always take things in context. He's talking about we're not in the flesh, we're in the spirit. But he comes back here and says this, if you through the spirit mortify the deeds of the flesh. That means you keep them controlled. You don't let them govern you. Amen? You don't let them control you. He just read, said in Romans 6, don't yield your members as servants of unrighteousness. He says, if you through the spirit, uh, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. The flesh, the body, the dictates have to be mortified by the people living out of their spirits. Not by saying it doesn't matter what I do because I'm born again. Now, if you're born again, then you're going to mortify, crucify, kill, control, dictate, buffet, rule, keep in subjection your flesh and desires. You're going to live out of the life of God. And the life of God is going to tell your flesh, no. No. Real simple. No. And when your flesh says, but I want to. No. Well, that's why Paul said he had to keep it under. He buffeted it. 
Think about that. Keeping that under. That's no fun. Nobody likes keeping it under. You know, when that 14th piece of pie is sitting there and you, you've had 13 and you want one more. Or Pastor Ed's barbecue sitting out there and you've already eaten three pounds. And you want one more bite. I don't know, and you tell your body, no, but I want it. I want it. Hello? You don't want a, a you know, an eight-ounce Coke. You want a, a, the whole two liter. See what the woman died recently? She was drinking five two-liter Cokes a day or something. No, ten. Ten two-liter Cokes a day, and it messed her system up so bad it killed her. Is that right? Was it 10 2 liters of That's okay. Yeah. <coughs> it was out of, she was in New Zealand. That's a lot of Coke. Even for, even for a Coke addict. I mean, I don't know if you could get that much in your system intravenously. Hello? So, his life is our life now. And that's where we're to live from. We're to live from the inner life. And by that life will cause us to do what? Mortify the deeds of the flesh. If you live from that, if you allow that, remember we, we read earlier where Paul wrote to the church and said, put off the former conversation and put on the new man. Put off the old, put on the new. Right, Ephesians, the fourth chapter. I, I, I like um, some breakdowns of the book of Ephesians. Bob Yanya has a really good, you know, um, and, and this is, it's not just, he didn't come up with this all by himself. There's a lot of, scholars and Greek and history and stuff. Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 is where we are positionally, what we have in us, what belongs to us, who we are. Ephesians 4, 5, and 6 is the application of that to, to daily life. I mean, it's very, you know, it's very interesting that Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 says, wherefore, what word the vocation wherewith you were called? If you just read Ephesians 1 through 3, the, the first three chapters, man, you think, man, I got it going on. And then he gets to chapter 4, verse 1 says, now what worthy of it? Which make it applicable to your life. Put it in operation in your life. Real simple. Here's where you are. Here's what you got. Here's what you have at your disposal. Here's the things that, that are in you. Now, use them. To do what? And then he spends the next three chapters telling you how you ought to act, live, do, think. Because of that life. Not to get that life, but because of that life. Because of who you are in Christ. Amen. You know, we talked on Ephesians some time back. <coughs> but, you know, uh, chapter 4, well, therefore, uh, I, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called with all lowliness and meekness and longsuffering, forbearing one another, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Talks about the one body. Um, talks about not being children. Talks to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Speak the truth in love. Uh, the whole body is fitly joined together. Ha says, um, the walk, not walk with other Gentiles, walk with the vanity of their mind. Um, and then in verse 22 says this of chapter 4, that you put out the former conversation, we talked about this earlier, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, be renewed in the spirit of your mind, put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Amen. And then he goes on and talks about all things we read earlier. Chapter 5, verse 1, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children. Walk in love as Christ has also loved us and given himself an offering and a sweet a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. But fornication and all uncleanness and covetousness, let it not once be named on you as becometh saints. Neither filthiness, foolishness, foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For you know, this you know, this you know, that no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you for, with vain words. What would vain words be? To say it doesn't matter. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God unto the, upon the children of disobedience. That's the children of disobedience. Be ye not therefore partakers with them. <laughs> because of these things, the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. Be not ye therefore partakers with them. Verse 11. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Oh, we just want to talk about the love of God. We don't make any feel bad. Anybody feel bad? 
Reprove them. For it's a shame to even speak of the things which are done to them in secret. And we can just go on and on and on and on and on. <coughs> this whole last chapter, this whole uh, last three verse chapters is talking about application in a daily life of that life that we have and the who we are from the first three chapters. And there's more we can grab out of there. I could just, we could just go on and on and on and be like lamb chops. This is a sermon that goes on and on, my friend. This is a sermon that goes on and on, my friend. <laughs> Pastor has started preaching it, not knowing what it was, and he'll continue preaching it forever just because. Anyway, that's. All right. Anybody ever heard Lamb Chops? This is a song that never ends. Who never heard that? You've never heard it? Y'all never heard. Y'all never watched PBS? Sunshine's heard it? You watch PBS. Okay. Hallelujah. 1 Timothy 4.8, For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having the promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. So we're going to stop here. We want to live from the inner man. We want to live out of the life of God. We do not want to live according to the dictates of our flesh. It's controls, it's desires, it's wants. You can And if you yield to it, you will. Hello? I mean, one of the, one of the reasons um, that pornography is so dangerous is people look at this and it begins to saturate their mind and because they're not renewing, remember, don't be conformed to the world, but be, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. What are you going to do? You look at that kind of stuff all the time, and you're going to conform to the world and go out like the world act. It's okay to sleep with everybody you can sleep with. It's okay to, to live in fornication. It's okay to do anything you want to do because, you know, you got by, God made you as a being that wants to be, you know, intimate. So, therefore, it's okay. It doesn't matter. If I love them, it's okay. It's just an expression of our love one for another. But fornication, um, actually, the... Um, not fornicate, porn, pornography comes from the Greek porn, comes from, is, is Latin, but it comes from, I believe, maybe it's Greek, but it comes from the Latin fornex, which means to, inf to incite to lust. Porn comes from that word fornex, which means incite to lust. And then geography obviously has to do with visual, you know, when you tell, you know, photography or, you know, videography and those kind of things, you start talking about uh, the visualization. You're using visual images to incite to lust. And people go out and listen to their flesh because they incite their flesh. They, they, they plague their flesh. You're supposed to be renewing your mind for the purpose of breaking world conformity, and that is attacking one of the strongest driving forces in a human being with images that are designed to incite them to put their flesh in enmity against the things of God, to rebel against God. And it, it, the internet and, you know, I mean, it used to be, you know, the, the, the guys who sold them in the, in, the, in the gas station, that was bad enough. But the internet, man, that holds a whole new world. That's a whole new world. I mean, because, you know, because of people's demand for freedom of speech and et cetera. And so they, they deliberately put stuff out there to entrap uh, people. That, that's what they want. Well, I know somebody that used to be, a, that, was, that was Christian. Um, and... Um, they got off, and then their wife divorced and got separated. They were spending, uh, I talked to someone who knew, they were, they were, some, some days they're spending between $75 and $200 a day for video porn on the Internet. Now, what's happened? We know Romans 12, 2 said, Be not conformed to the world, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By feeding on the world, they were not only um, conformed, they were entrapped and controlled by the world in, 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 in bondage. Christ will set you free. Well, if they're born again, they wouldn't do that. Let me tell you something. You give your flesh the opportunity and it'll entrap you. It just will. It just will. You make, the, the Bible says this, 
We are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and have placed no confidence in the flesh. Amen? That was, that was a scripture summary of that, but I was thinking of another scripture. Um, but we, we, we place, you, you can't place any confidence in the flesh because your flesh will entrap you. We are the circumcision. We worship God in the spirit. And we give no, we place uh, no confidence in the flesh. Your flesh will get you, baby. And by living out of the life on the inside and by feeding on the word of God and by saying no to your flesh and keeping it under, you keep yourself out of trouble. Okay. Yeah, I was, look, I was looking for the scripture talking about make, make no provision for the flesh. The Bible tells us to make no provision. Um, throw this in the old clothes. Okay, I just love sometimes you say things and they're, and they're, they're worded in a way that didn't show up in your little Make not provision. That's that type of no provision. I couldn't get it. Romans 13, 14. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You make provision and you will fulfill the lust thereof. And you might think you can get away with it and not do it. You might think you can walk right up to the edge of the line. You keep hanging around that ditch bank, baby, and you're going to slide down. It's like, it's like people think they can flirt innocently and just, and just have fun. That, that's making provision for the flesh. Did y'all know that? Being flirtatious and, and flirting and, and kind of getting up to that line and, and getting the, the, the thrill But, you're not, but we're not going to do. I'm not. I'm not going to follow through with that. I'm just. I'm just. I'm just having fun. You're making provision for the flesh, and you. And you'll get. And eventually, you'll get the opportunity to fulfill the lust thereof. And if you've gone far enough down the road, you will. Why? Because the mind gets involved. You got to live out of your spirit. You got to be a spirit-led being. Amen. That went around. Just great note to finish on, isn't it?